So hi, everyone. Uh, if you just connected, welcome to the first ASA Web Archaeological Society of America webinar. Sorry for the technical difficulties. And then I'm going just to uh, give the start and the introduction to Patricia Petrantonio. She's the current president of the Archaeological Society of America. Uh, welcome, Patricia. Thank you. Well, it is my tremendous pleasure to start this uh, international seminar, webinars, and actually all the credit goes to the subcommittee um, that did all this background work to get these two tremendous scientists with us uh, this uh, today, this afternoon. So good afternoon in Texas, good evening in Europe, and uh, we're really, really pleased today to present two research directors at the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, uh, Food and Environment. Uh, they're located in Montpellier, France. And um, they have a tremendous, tremendous career in acarology, both of them. Uh, our first speaker uh, is Maria Navajas. She, her main interest, uh, scientific interest, focuses on the ecology and evolution of micropests and their management within a population genetic framework. Emphasis is on emerging threats caused by invasive species. She serves as an expert in numerous national and international scientific panels and committees. Um, she's truly a leader in the field. Uh, she serves as an expert in numerous national um, uh, committees, as I said, she acted for more than 10 years as vice chair of the Plant Health Panel at the European Food Safety Authority, the EFSA. Currently, she serves as an expert for the French National Agency and says in the Committee for Biological Risks for Plant Health. Dr. Navajas is part of the editorial and managing board of the four main journals devoted to acarology. Uh, she is also an active member of the Acarological Society of America, and we're always thrilled to hear her uh, insights. Uh, the second speaker is Denise Navia. She's also a research director at the French National Research Institute for Agriculture, Food and Environment, the INRAE, and they're both developing activities at the Center for Biology and Management of Populations. And uh, Denise has been there since May 2021. She previously worked for 20 years as a researcher at the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation, Unit uh, Genetic Resources and Biotechnology in Brasilia, Brazil. She has been working in acarology for 27 years and has developed projects on systematic of plant mites, both phytophagous and predatory families, and in some cases employing an integrative approach. Uh, she also uh, has worked in bioecology and biocontrol of invasive mites, genomics for the development of control strategies for phytophagous mites, and also on the effect of agroecosystem diversification and the ecological regulation services provided by predatory mites. In parallel to research activities, she also worked for 30 years at the plant germplasm quarantine station in Brapa and oversaw the acarology laboratory. So without further ado, I'm really excited to present both of them. Thank you, enjoy. Okay, Maria, I think you're on. Okay, so thank you for this nice presentation, Patricia. And um, so good evening from, from Southern France in Montpellier where uh, Denise Navia and myself are uh, at that moment. It's a pleasure to be here uh, to share with you the, our work. And it's also an honor to open this series of webinars of the Society of um, Ecology Society of America. Next. Next, uh, yeah. So we have here very nice pictures of, of uh, mites. And if we, we put, if I uh, put the, the, the question, what all these mites have in common? Well, they are all plant mites, but we know the plant mites are a thousand of plant mites. For instance, the two family, important family uh, plant mites, uh, uh, like the Tetranikidae and Eriophidae, uh, they gather over 20,000 uh, species. So what these specific mites gather, as they are all invasive, that means that uh, uh, causes harm to um, eco ecology or agronomy. And that is going to be the focus of our talk today. Next. So the outline, so we are, when we, are we, 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 we I will presenting or discussing why to study when, why you are concerned uh, about uh, invasive species. 
uh, they are in high numbers, they are having significant economic impact, and this is a challenge for agriculture. In the second part, Denise will um, present specific case studies uh, from mainly from the Americas and also from Europe as examples. And we finalize with a summary of the list lessons that we've taken from the past and foreseen my best invasions. Next, please. So, uh, so we know that uh, um, always species have moved between continents for millennia. There is an acceleration in the rate of movements of people and commodities around the world, and that increases the opportunities for the introduction of new invasive species. And what is a problem is that these movements have dramatically increased in the last decades. Next, please. So beyond the ecological and economic costs that are very significant, the economic costs are very significant. As an example, the cost to Europe in terms of controlling and eradicating invasive uh, species, but also to overcome the damages that they cause, are estimated and over than 12 billion years of euros a year over the past 20, 20 years. Next. We know also that the risk of these movements of species introduction of invasions as is increasing with uh, the increasing pressures in ecosystems and also for uh, in climate change condition. So we can uh, easily say that the two main drivers of their invasions are global movements as also climate change. Next, please. Uh, we distinguish four uh, stages of a biological invasion. So introduction, sometimes called entry, establishment, spread, and impact. Uh, there is what is called a lag phase between the moment of the introduction until the impact are recognized. And this lag phase can be more or, or less long. Next, please. For instance, in the, in the, for the citrus brown mite, the species was reported for the first time in Europe in 1935 in Southern Europe in Cyprus. And it took more over 60 years to really cause problems in uh, citrus groves, for instance, in Southern Spain. Next, please. To each uh, lag phase, there are also management actions that can be taken. And these management, management, management actions uh, are reduced or are different, but the, 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 well, the, 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 they are reduced with the area affected and also through time. While the prevention between the, the entry is the best uh, option uh, to take on, once it's already entering an area, we can, the early detection is also what is, is need to be done. And then when this is not uh, even possible, we start with, uh, with uh, strategies to manage what is the invasive species. Uh, next, please. But we know that the cost with time and area affected um, are also increasing, like costs are increasing uh, because the management options become limited. Next, please. So for this reason, the interest be, uh, to study invasive, uh, invasive in general, arthropods and pests in general, but not also arthropods, uh, has increasing in the last year. And Akari also are also in this invasion, bio invasions wave. If uh, are here represented, for instance, and an, a proxy, the number of publication on web of science when I use the keywords invasions and Akari, and we see that they are increasing steadily. Next, please. And, but we see also that, that, I, that if we introduce a keywords, uh, climate change and, and, uh, and uh, ACARI, the, the, the increasing of interest is also very important. And in, even it is including uh, overpassing the interest for invasions. Next, please. No, before, please. Yeah. Uh, here is represented the, the number of uh, spider mites that are in, in invasive to Europe through time. And what we see that, uh, as, as I already told, the numbers are increasing. 
uh, steadily. And it, but but this, this, this uh, figure uh, shows us also very interesting. It's in red and in, um, uh, are shown the, spe the invasive species to, to Europe that have a tropical origin. So what is really significant, if we put it in relationship to climate change, because this species, we can think that it will uh, find better uh, possibilities to introduce in new areas. Next, please. And here I will move to, to those examples that, that of invasions that are very well known. And this is Tetranicus urtici and Tetranicus evansai. Next, please. So we know that urtici is a harmful uh, crop pest. It, got, it gathers features that favor invasion and is current, currently a uh, cosmopolitan. But we know also that the expansion is favored by new environmental conditions. And I will uh, follow these different points. Next, please. So we know that um, the Tetranicus urtici is a serious crop for has uh, several features that makes it an excellent crop pest. But I want to, to focus on two of those these features. Is one is the ability to develop re rapid resistance to pesticides. Next, uh, for instance, is in the top uh, 20 of the species uh, developing resistance among the arthropods in agricultural and in urban areas. That is one. And also, is because it's highly polyphagous, it has been reported for over 1,000 plant species for uh, 140 different plant families. And among these, 200 are crops. Next, please. So, a highly polyphagous, it, is, it can be easily transported by plants. And we know that humans have always lived with plants. So whenever possible, they are transported plants in their luggage. The problem is with the plants, they have also transported, or we are transporting pests. Next, please. I see many species arrive on new continents after the 16th century, where are the countries of the big expeditions. Next, please. And plants have been moving around the world uh, by humans. And uh, the Americas is a big provider of crops, uh, for instance, uh, to, to Europe and other continents. Here have maize, very important crops have, have moved from, from America to other continents and from other continents also around the world, like, like wheat, like, the, like, like rice from Asia and so on. So we know that. But, for, for a species Tetranicus urtici, who is highly polyphagous, the possibility to be transported with lots of different plants is obvious. Next, please. Next, okay. So if we have a look here, uh, so, so we got interested uh, together with Denise and a uh, student, Renata Santos, on the diversity of fish species around the world. We wanted to know how the different haplotypes were distributed in the world. And for that, uh, we use, um, well, Renata actually, which is a PhD, um, use the ribosomal DNA ITS2 to, to, um, to characterize diversity. And that is the different haplotypes that were found. Next, please. The next, the, well, what is first comes up from this figure is the one haplotype, haplotype one is highly distributed. But we see also that the highest diversity of haplotypes uh, appears in the Mediterranean basin with 15 haplotypes identified. So the hypothesis of a paleoarctic origin of the species is supported. We also in the in previous uh, uh, studies have also uh, advanced this hypothesis. Next, please. So, but, um, although cosmopolitan, species, we know that in the last years, the species has been reported in areas where there was not to be a, a, a concern in the past. For instance, here for potato fields in northern France, with recent reports where the, the species was not a pest in the, in, the, in the past, and now it's a pest. Next, please. Next. So... And this is to put in to put in, uh, in in connection or to link with climate change because with climate change will facilitate the spread and st establishment of invasives. 
because we extreme variable weather with events events are predicted during this climate and ch uh, change scenarios. Next, please. And no previous. And we know that temperature and drought are favorable conditions for the development of spider mites. Next. Next. Yeah, thank you. And uh, so colleagues in, in Spain have uh, um, ha um, studied how the tetranico, no, actually three different uh, pests for, for tomato, Tetranicus urtici, Tetranicus evansi, but also Lycoperson, uh, Aceria Lycopersicum. Um, uh, and they in, in the laboratory could show that drought stress tomato uh, enhances the performance of three, these three my, uh, plant my, uh, pests. Thank you. Next, okay. So what we wanted to see is how the different uh, populations, field populations of Urtiki were responding to this drought stress. And for that, we sample uh, 12 populations along in, in Europe along a gradient of climatic conditions. Here is represented with do red dots and the map is the background color scale, the global aridity index. So we, we collected uh, uh, populations in the field in, di in different latitudes from very arid areas in Southern Europe to more uh, wet areas in, in more Northern Europe. Next, please. So we brought this uh, um, these populations to the laboratory and to settle to settle a, a experimental world where we produce um, um, drought stress uh, beans in this case plants here represented in red and um, normally watered plants and uh, we uh, um, um, put uh, um, spider mites and certain number of spider mites, everything control, of course, in arenas, in, in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in the leaves with all the repetitions and so on. I do not have time to go in, uh, in, the, in detail. And, he, and then we measure different uh, parameters of the, um, of the developmental uh, time of this of this match in the different conditions, and in this in these graphs there are the developmental time egg to adult of the twelve populations when we're rare in drought stress plants here in yellow or non-stress here in green, and the first result is that all mice develop faster when reared in drought stressed plants. But next, please. Next, thank you. So uh, the difference, not all, uh, not all populations respond the same way. So when is, uh, some uh, populations, uh, developmental time was just 0.5 uh, faster. The others, next, please. Next. Okay, was over 1.35 days faster. So there are differences depending on the origin of the of the populations. Next, please. Okay, and here what we or the, we we did with the co colleagues in the in, in 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 the lab. So we projected a PCI analysis where we put together the this developmental time uh, uh, data with uh, different um, climatic conditions uh, var variables actually twenty, and what comes very clear from these results are there are two different uh, groups of, of, of populations. Uh, the one here um, in pink, let's say, so it um, discriminates the dry and hot Mediterranean cluster, the pink one, from another cluster with all the oceanic and continental wet temperate localities here in green. Next, please. Another way to represent, but is perhaps more, uh, more clear, is here in the yellow bar, there is the difference in an adult percentage of emergent day nine between the drought and non-drought challenge and mites. And the background map is represented the summer drought index. Next, please. And well, drought will impact mice uh, pests differently in South Northern European uh, localities. And the major changes in mite performance expected, expected in more human e European region, which is not 
really what we were expecting. We have some hypothesis to explain that. Next, please. I will now to move to the second example, Tetranicus evansi. The, um, the situation is a little bit different. This is it's a re recent expansion. It is less polyphagous, much less. It's mainly on solanaceous plants. It's presently a serious problem in Africa, but we will see that the evasiveness depend on the genetic background. Next, please. Okay, and that uh, it will take the, the opportunity to, to, to do a, a, a quick focus on the need of really use good taxonomy when I'm, we are dealing with invasive species. Because at the beginning, when it was detected for the first time in, uh, in, in Africa, uh, it was misidentified be, uh, between uh, Tetranicus urtici. This is when we uh, analyzed the, the, what they were thinking was urtici in Africa, we analyze it in the lab. Next, please. And we uh, apply in this case, well, we are back to the, to the early, uh, to, uh, early uh, century actually. Yeah, so it's, we are discussed, <clears throat> we apply very basic DNA barcoding using ITS2 in this case. But anyway, it was very well, but very clear separate the two species. Next, please. Next. Please, and uh, I, 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 so this focus is important because if you don't know which species you are dealing with, you are going to go even uh, have, uh, more important problems to deal with. And for instance, this, this is relevant. I will not say common, but it's something that really happens. But because the same the same species. And we were work, working with colleagues in Japan. The species Evansai was first identified as another different species, which is called Tetranicus takafuji. So, I mean, this kind of problems occurs, and we need to be aware of that. Next, please. Okay, the species that's in, in red, we have the present distribution of this species. But, uh, and the first uh, reports of the species are from 1954, and this is from uh, Northern East Brazil, but a short effort was also reported from the Ocean Andean Islands, and also not, not late after, was also reported from Southern uh, America, uh, North America, sorry. Next, please. The species start to, no, before, please. The species start to move around Africa and, and, and it arrived in the 1995 in Europe, first in Portugal. And uh, we are detected in 2005 in, in our region, in France. Next, please. Okay, so um, next, please, also. Yeah. Thank you. So the species, when we started to detect it, it was causing heavy, heavy outbreaks in greenhouses, in tomato here, but also in aubergines and many solanaceous. Next, please. So this motivate us to start a, a, a big, a quite big program to understand what are the movements of this species and how the colonization happened. So the first thing is to get a good sample. Uh, and that was tremendous effort with uh, different colleagues. Actually, Denise also collaborated a lot, being the species from South America. And we managed to, to gather uh, almost three, 300 individuals collected from 21 different localities. And we apply quite common, I mean, quite usual um, genetic markers, ITS, mitochondrial CO1. And we also developed for this study microsatellites. And then, uh, we, so the first thing is we, we identified two very clear different haplotypes, and one was more uh, highly invasive, what is here in yellow, and the other was seems to be less invasive, what is here in pink. And uh, applying also some computer modeling, and based also on the genetic results, we could um, suggest oh, the best likely uh, scenario, the best supported scenario. So the, the pathways of introduction of movement seems to be quite complicated. Um, here I represented with, uh, with arrows. And uh, what, is, what is strikes is the most is that one is really very, very invasive or more invasive than the other one. Next, please. 
this uh, difference in invasiveness uh, um, conduct us to uh, to start new new um, new new work in the lab because um, the hypothesis that came us to us is well is a is a tropical species or subtropical species. So perhaps the, the difficulty to spread in other, in other uh, more uh, cold areas like in Europe is linked to, to cold, the resistance to cold. So what we did is we compared um, um, the mice with the two different origins and we stressed these mice uh, with uh, with uh, cold temperatures in the laboratory. Here is the small description of the um, of the cold exp exposure experimental design. But what very clear, we saw here in yellow again, so that the most invasive uh, haplotype resists much better to cold than the other one. Next, please. I will uh, escape this one and the next one, please. And this, okay, perfect. So what we did here as we, projected the distribution of, uh, of climate or the possibility of settlement of this urtiki based on the habitat suitability for this species, knowing the biology of the species. And it's, in, in, it's interesting because in the upper part of the slide, the haplotype one, some seems to be established in the, in the areas where the habitat is suitable because it matches very well what the present quite well, let's say, with the present distribution of the of the of haplotype one in, in the world. While the other uh, haplotype, the big one, the less invasive, seems to be related only to coastal areas. So it seems that here the possible the capability to spread is really more reduced. Next please. And just to, to summarize this, this first part. So we, the invasions, we, we know better, you know, we it's sure that we are gathering more and more information. Now we start to know much with, with, some, with, with some recent invasions from the last decades that are causing extensive damage that have motivated a lot of work. But also, it remains also difficult to predict which non-native species will become invasive. And for this, we, based also with many, many other uh, examples. And that is going to be the second part of the talk with invasions from the last decades with case studies uh, uh, from the Americas, also from Europe. And we finalized with lessons that we, that we taking from the past and foreseen mite invasions. And with this, I give the floor to Denise. Thank you. Okay, Denise, can you please share your screen? Hello, uh, I'm trying. Let's see if it works. No, we have the same problem. Okay, so I'm just gonna share it again. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, Maria presented very important information on two well-studied invasive mites. Uh, all this information help us to understand invasion process in a changing world in, in climate change scenarios. That during the last decades, we had numerous phytophagous mite invasions in the world. Here, I'm present just a few examples from the Americas and Europe that bring us some lessons also that may be useful to prevent and mitigate impact of new invasions. And also that uh, bring us questions that needs to be addressed. Next. 
uh, during the last decades, the most remarkable mite invasions in the Americas was no doubt the red palm, palm mite, Hauiella indica. It's not a spider mite, it's a tenuipalped mite. This species was described from India in 1924, and then it was reported in North Africa, Middle East, and the Indian Ocean Islands. In all these areas, the populations caused no extensive damage. It means the mite had no pest status in these areas, and uh, just three palm trees were reported as host plants for Hauiella indica. Next. In the Americas, the red palm mite was for first reported in 2004 in Martinica. Uh, many times when a pest is reported in a new area, it's not possible to know if it has been present there for a long time. However, in the case of Hauiella indica, we have strong evidences that the introduction really occurred in the early of 2000s. Since extensive faunistic surveys have been conducted in the French Antilles just before, and Hauiella indica had not been found there. Uh, this might spread in with impressive speed to other Antilles, and in three years it reached South America, Venezuela, and also North America, Florida. And uh, uh, it's very possible that Caribbean hurricanes favor the fast spread of this mite in the whole Caribbean and to the, to the Americas continental. Uh, the main coconut production countries in South, in Americas, uh, Mexico e, and Brazil, the mite was reported for first in 2009. And even if, uh, Contential measures have been applied to avoid its fast dissemination. Currently, it is widespread along the main coconut, coconut production areas in these countries. And in America, we have explosions, impressive explosions, population explosions, greatly favored by uh, dry periods. And we observe a gradual decrease in coconut production in many countries. For example, in Trinidad Tobago, growers estimated a reduction higher than 70% in coconut production five years after uh, Hauiella Indica introduction. Next. The fast spread of Hauiella indica in the Americas took place in parallel with a surprising expansion of its roster range. In the old world, Hauiella was reported infesting just three palm trees. And in the Americas now, uh, currently, we have around 80 species of palm trees as host plants, as multi generational host plants of Hauiella, including 25 neotropical palm tree species. And it also infests other seven families of monocotyledon, of monocots, especially uh, ornamental plants. Okay. Next, please. Uh, next. More. Okay. Uh, Hauiella indica in the Americas also infested seriously other host plants of economic importance that are the banana. And although we have not yet information on the 
impact in the production of banana symptoms are really very strong and are of concern for growers. And also it has caused problems uh, on native palm trees, like in Trinidad Tobago, infesting Moorish palm in natural areas. Uh, then it's very, really important uh, environmental impacts that this invasive mite is causing in the Americas. Next, please. Population genetic studies based on the CO1 uh, sequences suggested an Indo Middle East origin for Hauiella indica. And the most interesting is that in the Americas, we have just one haplotype, it means that we don't have generic variability in the Americas, uh, like observed for other invasive mites, as, as Maria told us. And it's not possible to know if we have one or multiple introductions of the mite in the Americas. Uh, anyway, uh, in considering geopolitical and commercial relationships, it's possible that the introduction in the America had occurred from the Indian Ocean Islands. It has to be investigated in further studies. Next, please. Well, ornamental plants are usually assumed as an important pathway for pests. But in the case of the red palmite, a recent report brings it in evidence. The first report of the mite in Paraguay is based on the detection of the mite on nurseries of palm trees imported from Brazil. In that country, the mite occurrence is still restricted to the nursery. Mites were not found in neighbor areas. Next, please. Recent reports of uh, the red palm mite in Brazil and in South America indicate that the southern latitudinal limit for the red palm mite has expanded. It's possible that is, this expansion is linked to ongoing climate change scenarios, conditions, and prediction models considering climate change scenarios have showed that the mite could establish in the stream south of Brazil, and it has recently been observed. It's going to be interesting follow the population dynamics of the mites in these uh, recently affected areas. Next, please. Successful biological control projects for invasive mites have been conducted in the past. The best example, it was the green cassava green mite in Africa. And for similar purposes, efforts were directed to the prospection of natural enemies of the red palm mite in the old world. However, results were a, a bit disappointed. In all the prospected areas, the dominant predatory mite associated with Hauiella indica was Amblyseus largoensis was the phytoseid, Amblyseus largoensis. A gener generalist predatory mite, also widespread in America. This mite, it, uh, it's really helpful. Uh, it can help to control populations, but it's not a solution for uh, explosions, populations of the mite. Uh, we tested hypotheses that this mite uh, in different continents could be a, crypt, a complex of cryptic uh, species. However, this hypothesis is one not confirmed. And currently, native predatory mites are under evaluation to control populations 
of how Yela Indica, for example, in Brazil, with uh, encouraging results. Next. Uh, the coconut mites, the coconut eryophyte mites, Aceria guerreronis, is an old coconut pest in the Americas. And in high-tech production areas, control of Aceria guerreronis have been, has been conducted by spraying the bunches. However, this control is not, if, not at all efficient to how Yela indica since the whole tree top is infested by the mites. Spraying the whole canopy would increase the cost of control of, and, and in the case of chemical control, would have a really, really uh, impact, environmental impact. Therefore, we have one more. Uh, we have uh, maybe the main lesson is that one more Pest might pest in a crop can mean an expressive increase in control cost and also in environmental impacts. Next, please. Other one more. Uh, other example, other interesting example of invasive mite in the Americas is the citrus industan mite, Schizotetranicus industanicus. Coincidentally, this species was also described from India in 1924. Is the same description in the same paper that the red palm mite was described. And for almost 80 years, its now distribution was restricted to India. Until 2002, it was reported in 2002, the mite was reported occurring in Venezuela. And fastly, this end, in some years, disseminated to north of Brazil and also Colombia. Next, please. When carrying out the identification of invasive species, specimens in the Americas, it, we noticed that the taxonomic description of the taxon, it was really poor, and that the taxon was morphologically very close to other two Schizotetranicus species, also associated with citrus, and both also reported from India. The other species are Schizotetranicus ispiculus and Schizotetranicus baltazari. In the case of Indostanicus, the species was described from, one, from a single male, and Spiculus was described just from females. And baltazari was described based on just a few morphological differences that uh, I think that should be better studied. Then it's possible that these three species that have different uh, geographic distribution now, you can see that Baltazari uh, is, presents a much more, uh, is, is reported in many, many countries in Southeast Asia and it's possible if these species are confirmed, also synonyms, uh, introduction of the mite in South America could, be, could have been originated not just from India, but from also many other countries. Then from here, we, we, we realize that taxonomic uh, gaps, especially in groups of invasive mites, may, compro may compromise the adoption of uh, phytosanitary measures. Next, please. Concerning Indostanicus, it's possible that uh, strategies, biological control strategies used to other uh, citrus mites will, will not work to Indostanicus. This mite is very interesting 
colonies are sheltered under nest webs and mites are protected from predatory mites. Then here we have another case in that the introduction of an additional mite pest to a crop that is already infested by other mite pests can disrupt control strategies previously established. Next, please. One more. Now, I would like to stress in another aspect of plant mite invasions, that is the ability of some species to transmit virus, which can increase enormously the impact of invasions. Many species of mites, we know that they have, they have a pest status not due to their direct damage, but due to their their action as vectors. We have vectors in two families of uh, phytophagous mites. The number of virus uh, transmitted uh, by mites has increased a lot in the last years, maybe due to more accurate uh, uh, methods diagnostic for, for virus. And then it's important to note that even if the vector species is already present in a new area, new introductions can result in a new plant virus introduction. Next, please. An example of a device team invasive mite virus complex is the weight is the wheat coal mite, Aceria tosichella, and the transmitted virus. These uh, species can transmit three virus, and mixed infections can occur. This complex was widely disseminated in Europe and North America for a long time, causing serious impacts. However, in Australia and in South America, this complex emerged at early 2000. In South America, the wheat uh, streak mosaic virus, the main, vi the main virus transmitted by Tosichella, was detected in Argentina in 2002. And uh, in few years, uh, impressive episodics were caused by this complex of uh, mite virus and in the main wheat production areas of that country, causing really, really serious losses. Next one, please. Uh, since the identification of the relationship between wheat, wheat streak mosaic virus and Aceria tosichella, the control has focused on plant resistance. Uh, then for more than 60 years, uh, efforts have been directed to the development of resistant cultivars, but uh, results, but uh, it's uh, also somewhat disappointing. Many cultivars were released, but uh, there have been breaks in the resistance, in the plant resistance, due to the increasing complexity of the pathosystem with new virus being described associated with the mite and, and mixed infections, and also due to the increase in temperature that break resistance in some uh, cultivars. In the USA, Increasing impact has been reported during the last years, possible as a, uh, as a result of climate change due to the longer and warmer falls that can result in an increasing time for wheat comite population growth and, for, and then for virus transmission. Next, please. And it's also interesting to note that invasions can create opportunity to new interactions. 
can be synergistic to invasive species and increase their impact. For example, we can have new vectors. Concerning mites, we have an interesting, um, we have a very interesting example of a new interaction that occurred after the introduction of an invasive weed, Rosa multiflora, in the North America. Uh, the interaction between is the interaction between the weed, the ereophyte mite Philocoptus, Philocoptus frutiflus, and the plant Emanavirus. Uh, the mite uh, became a, a vector, as is for first reported as a vector for this virus. This new interaction became the rheophyte mite, a successful biological control agent of this weed in North America. However, it represents a threat to, Rosa, to roses productions in the world since the virus, the mana virus, is a host, uh, it can be in fact also uh, cultivated roses. This, this complex, this mite virus complex has been regulated as a quarantine pest for the EPO, the European Plant Protection Organization. Next, please. Uh, another interesting example from the Americas, the last uh, example from the Americas is the lychee erinos mite, erinos mite, Aceria lychee, in Brazil. Uh, lychee has been introduced in Brazil around two, 200 years ago. And it, initially it was cultivated in the southeastern region, but it expanded for many regions in the country. And it was considered a crop, a fruit tree crop, extremely resistant to pests. However, the introduction of the lychee rhinos might completely change this scenario. Symptoms were first reported in Brazil in 2008, and in 10 years, the mite disseminated throughout the production lychee area in the country. Uh, we have uh, reports of uh, yield reduction of our, uh, high, even higher than 70% and a significant increase in costs productions and many, many growers have abandoned the crop. Uh, it's, prob it's possible this, this mite was regulated as a quarantine pest in Brazil. Then the introduction maybe uh, can have, can have uh, occurred due to the illegal introduction of propag propagative material in the country. Next, please. Now I'm, I'm uh, uh, moving to Europe. I have uh, some really interesting examples. Uh, I would like to present first two invasive mites originated from different regions in the world and that were introduced in Europe in close periods of time. And their spatial, their expansion in the invaded area is occurring simultaneously. They belong to the same genus. They are Eutetranicus species. Uh, Eutetranicus banksi is originated from the Americas, probably is originated from Mexico. Some Genetic studies show that it is um, uh, originated from Central America and has disseminated in other countries in, in the Americas. In Eutetranicus orientalis uh, presented widespread distribution in Oriental and Afrotropical regions. It, 
Orientalis was reported for the first time in Europe in 2001 and Banksy in Portugal uh, in 1999. That is interesting to note that both species, they are polyphagous, and, but the main uh, host plants are citrus. Next, please. Uh, studies have been conducted to evaluate what is happening through, from this unpredicted meeting of two invasive species, two Eutetranicus invasive species. It has been observed that Banksy uh, expanded its distribution until the north of the Comunidad Valenciana reaching higher northern latitudes. And now, currently, this species is infesting the whole citrus production area in Spain. Differently, Orientalis did not expand its northern distribution and since 2013. Further studies should be conducted to understand why Banksy is really expanding its distribution, its northern distribution, and not Orientalis. Next, please. Concerning the co occurrence of these invasive mites in citrus in Spain, uh, it's possible to note that they can coexist and also with. Panonico citrus, that citri, that is an older invasive mite in citrus in Spain, they can coexist, but it has been observed that uh, uh, the Eutetranicus banksi is the predominant species in Valencia orchards and is displacing the other two species. In addition, here we have a case of an invasive species causing disruption of biological control programs. The biological control for citrus pests in Spain, it was very, very well established and Euseus stipulatus was the main predatory mite in that crop. However, it, uh, it's not, it has not been efficient to control Eutetranicus banksi because uh, population peaks occur in different moments. Uh, Euseus stipulatus not resist to high temperatures and low uh, humidity uh, that occurs in the end of the summer in Spain and that just correspond to the peak population, uh, populational peak of Eutetranicus banksi. Next, please. Uh, similarly to Eutetranicus banksi, we have uh, another invasive mite causing impact in fruit trees in the Mediterranean region of Europe. Uh, is Oligonicus persea. Uh, genetic studies have shown that this species is originated from Mexico and had spread to United States and to Central America. Uh, it's, it constitutes an avocado pest in the, in, in the areas in the, in the Americas. And this species was introduced in south, uh, in south of East Spain in 2004. Next, please. One more. Okay. Oligonicus persea uh, is, have, has also its other species that we are observing an expansion in the latitudinal range in relation to the other occurrence areas in the Americas. And is also expanding 
the roast range. Now in Portugal and Italy, it has been observed causing uh, damage symptoms in grapevine. Uh, and uh, there is some concern that this might can also uh, in can also infest grapevines and will not just affect avocados in south in south east spain next one next please and Oligonicus persea is another example of an invasive mite that has been favored by climate change scenarios and that is escaping of biological control agents, uh, predatory mites that were present in the invaded area. Next, please. A uh, very interesting study conducted by Monsiha, by Marta Monsiha in Malaga, showed that uh, explained why uh, the mites, the predatory mites that occur in the area that are Californicus and also Stipulatus, they did not respond to populational peaks of Oligonicus persea. Uh, in the oh, oligonicus, yes, uh, oligonicus persea is highly favored by high temperatures and low humidity, while the predatory mites greatly decrease. We observe a decrease in populations for the predatory mites under these conditions. Next, please. Well, uh, we have from this, from all the invasions, all the cases of invasions by phytophagous mites presented in this webinar, we have some lessons and we have many, many questions that uh, still, to, still to need to be answered. Well, related to mite invasions, genetics, and climate change, as explained by Maria, we know that the invasion success of the mites depends greatly on the genetic background of the introduced population. Uh, we, we observe highly invasive haplotypes uh, in, in the invaded areas, and we observe for different populations, populations with different genetic background, differentiated response to drought stress. And due to that, uh, multiple introductions from different origins can lead to a higher impact of invasive mites. If you introduce, if you have a new introduction of a population, that presents a more a higher tolerance uh, to different uh, extreme climatic conditions, it can become a new pest in a, an, an, an area. And we have observed that uh, invasive mites from the different families, uh, spider mites, tenripalped mites, and eriophid mites, uh, have been favored by climate change scenarios, we need to still uh, conducting studies to better understand this. But we observe expansion, an, an expansion of latitudinal range for establishment. We also observe increasing severity of damage caused by some species and disruption of biological control linked to climate change scenarios. Next one, please. Uh, we have also the interesting example uh, of uh, taxonomic gaps related to Schizotetranicus that can lead 
to fails in the elaboration of phyt phyt phytosanitary regulations and can make difficult reconstruction of invasion routes that sometimes are very important to development of uh, strategies for control of these invasions. Uh, one question is that uh, prediction of mite invasions, it is, is it possible or not? This question is because we observe some really important invasions in the last decades by mites, by species that had no pest status in the old world. Then these species were not uh, considered as a threat. They were not listed as quarantine pests in regulations of the invaded countries. We also observe uh, very, uh, that uh, the Mediterranean region and the Caribbean are regions that we could consider as hotspots for invasions. We presented some examples here, but we have many other examples of invasions arriving, uh, invas invasive species arriving in the continents by these regions. It means that we need to uh, adopt the regional measures, plant, plant protection measures to protect the whole continent. And we can also observe that eradication uh, is normally not feasible for uh, mite invasions. Because, uh, 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 because after introduced in um, open crops, it's almost impossible to eradicate it then. The dissemination through uh, natural ways, for example, aerial dispersal is, uh, is very fast, is very fast. And also, as known for many, many pests, we reinforce, uh, we would like to emphasize the risk, the right risk of the transport of ornamental plants and vegetative propagation material related to mite introductions. Next, please. Well. Thank, thank you a lot for your attention. And I would like also to thanks for all colleagues around the world that, has, that uh, have worked and have shared information on invasive mites. Uh, this talk gave an overview, we hope, of the threats that mite invasions are for agriculture. And we have... Uh, many, many groups working in this subject. Uh, we, I also would like to mention that uh, uh, we have important groups, really, really prominent teams working with invasive mites in North America and Mexico, USA and Canada. Uh, uh, but here we presented a vision a little bit more from our career, our work during the last decades. And we are available here. We are we, you welcome if you have some interest to contribute with our projects in this beautiful region of the Mediterranean area in France. And I also would like to, to invite you to join the Latin American Society of America. And this year we are going to have the fourth Latin American Congress of Acarology. And in Europe, we are going to have this year the 19th Symposium of the European Association of Acarologists. 
then we hope to meet you in these events. Thank you so much. Thank you both of you for an excellent overview of the challenge of mites. And um, I will, uh, the floor is open for questions. I'm gonna read the questions that uh, I think the first one comment is for Maria. Um, Uruguay is being very uh, invaded by red spider mites in peach trees, and it is not easy to apply biological controls. Uh, I don't know if it's common or you can comment on that. Uh, you're muted, Maria. Yeah, okay. So I'm not sure if the question uh, targets a specific species or, or just spider mites in, in, in... She said the red spider mites in ah, the red trees. Spider mites. I don't know. I don't have a, a ready, a ready answer question. I don't know if the niece can, uh, can, because it's, it's, it's a crop that I don't, I don't know that much, but uh, Denise, can you, do you have any idea to address this, this question? Uh, Patricia, uh, might uh, these introductions in Europe or? No, this one is in South America, in Uruguay. This is from Ethel, ah, Uruguay. Uh, Uruguay. Madera, and she mentions that Uruguay is being invaded by uh, peaches in Uruguay being invaded by red spider mites, and they're not easy to control. Because the problem uh, is that the red spider match is a little ambiguous because behind red spider mites, you put, can put many species, but... Uh, well, yes. Maybe the first question is to know if the species have been identified. Yeah. Okay. Well, we we'll move on then. Um, from Manoj uh, is asking why Tetranicus evansi is spread in coastal regions. Well, it's not only spreading coastal regions. But uh, it's not going very north because it's, it's, it's actually a tropical or subtropical species. So cold is probably you're maintaining it in, in, in not that cold areas. So it's not going, I would say that it's not going very north. And uh, as we, if you remember well, the person who put the, asked that is um, one of the haplotypes that are re less resistant to cold is the one that is, is, is sticking to coastal areas, which is, is probably a matter of- in purple in your- in yeah, your yeah, it's probably right. a matter of resistance to cold. Okay. And then from Jose Carlos in Puerto Rico, considering future climate change scenarios, could you estimate the crops that would be more susceptible to mite uh, damage? <laughs> That's uh, a million dollar question, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, no, I, I can don't... try. I can try. Okay, try. <laughs> Go, Denise. Good. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> crops are expanding and also mites. Sometimes mites just follow crops expansion. For example, avocados uh, before in Europe they were restricted to South Spain. Now, uh, Corsa is also uh, beginning, is starting to produce uh, avocados. And even they have some experiments in Nisi uh, with some varieties of avocados. Then I think we have two cases. Invasive species, they, they will follow expansion of crops that are establishing in new areas, but in other cases, no, they, the, the crops, they are already available in some areas and the mites, they are going to start to fall, to expanding in latitudinal areas. Then I think, I think that would be difficult to say what crops will be more affected. I think we have two scenarios different. 
for for this expansion. Okay, let's move on to the next one from Manoj. Uh, he's asking how to best preserve mites for further studies. I guess it's sample conservation. How do you keep uh, your mites when you collect them? I guess that's uh, we 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 oh, collect. Well, like, uh, yes. <laughs> If, if, I mean, for, for genetic studies, this is always it's still in ethanol. It's just a classic uh, way to, to preserve mites. So in ethanol, between okay. 90 and 100 percent, yeah. Ethanol, 100 percent. OK. Then another question. Uh, with respect to the Tetranicus erky, this is from Ada Mohammed Khan, I guess, is in Pakistan. Uh, with respect to urticate, do you say that there are strains, a species, or a species complex? Um, how how would you define the populations of ortique? Well, I, I would say that the, already for the morphology is quite quite I mean established the, the morphology to distinguish urtiki. And if not with with DNA, we can separate it quite quickly. It's not really an issue to separate uh, urtiki from even even for close related species. I mean, if you apply molecular work, it's quite easy. I mean, yeah. Okay. And then another, the same person asks, uh, why they develop um, fast resistance, or what and what is the difference between Urtica and Evansi, I guess, in the resistance development. Well, that is a really a big question. <laughs> Many, but no, but no, there is some some no no, but it's some answer because now that we have the the complete genome sequence the, from Urtiki, we start to know a little bit more, and there, there are work done by colleagues in 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 Belgium, very good work done on that, and it seems that is um because of this high polyphagy, it has all the machinery. To, to, to deal with also these um, exotic um, molecules that are pesticides. So this seems to, to be a link with the polyphagy. So we start to, to understand the mechanism now. So yeah. enzymatic metabolic uh, resistance yeah, could yeah, be the, yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. reason the, why. The person who asked that, there is a lot, well, no, I mean, there's a group working a lot on these questions in Belgium. I, I recommend him to, to, to have a look at okay. this. Um, here there is a, I like this. The Enrico De Lillo is offering to explain the question about areophytes and virus transmission. Um, so Enrico, if you want to, I don't know if you can be unmuted, um, but otherwise you can respond um, directly to, to him. Um, and I think there is um, another last question on why, um, how areophyte mice transmit the virus? Uh, what is the way in which they acquire the pathogen? And why very few species are reported why areophyte include more than 4,000 species? So why some are vectors, I guess, is the question. Uh, well, I think that this question, the Lee would like to answer, but I can try to do also. I'm not a specialist in virus transmission by ureophyte mites. I'm just starting to work with this, but the acquisition uh, uh, for most of the vectors, ureophyte mite vectors, the transmission is of uh, is persistent, and there is some hypothesis for, for Axeria tosicella, for example, that it could be circulative. It means it could even, the virus could replicate inside the mite. Then the mites, they acquire just a feeding in the infected cells, and they can transmit uh, so not for the next generation. For example, eggs will not be vectors. The, the larva originated from eggs will not be vectors, but uh, the efficient, the, the mite can change from phase stage stages and the adult can transmit. If acquisition is in the immature mites, adults can transmit. Even after molting, that's very interesting. 
Well, yes. I think we have had a fantastic uh, start. Congratulations to both of you and also to the subcommittee for having selected such wonderful uh, speakers. Uh, this has opened a lot more questions and interest. And I really thank the participants that have uh, provided questions because this is honestly an open forum for new ideas to uh, know our members. And again, I also, uh, Lorena, invite you to join the Acarological Society of America. And Denise, I enjoy you, um, invite you to join the Latin American Society. So there are a lot of forums open for us to interact. And also she mentioned the European Congress and also we're going to Vancouver. So I hope uh, seeing many of you there. Lorena, do you wanna say some closing words? Just want to thank everyone for attending and our speakers and Patricia, of course, and please join us for the next month. This is a web international webinar series. This is the first time but we're going to continue doing this every every month. We're going to be invited wonderful speakers just like Maria and Denise. So keep in tune. We're going to send out uh, the um, invitation for next month. And this presentation, the recording will probably be available in our website next week. So don't close yet. Don't close yet. We no, have no, no. Important, no, no. important questions here. Um, uh, Manal Ismael is asking how to join the society. So you can go to our website. I believe the Latin American Society also for students is really, really inexpensive. Only $10 plus $1 PayPal. <laughs> And um, you have a lot of advantages and possibilities, not only to interact with experts, but also get some awards, uh, financial awards to help you with travel. So I really invite you to look at the websites of both societies. And there is one last question for those of you that need to leave, please uh, feel free to leave. We're beyond the time. Um, but Christina Antonia Gomez ask, uh, nueve, uh, I'm gonna translate this in Spanish, okay? so. No species, no exotic species of Aitofagos um, mites are detected in the Caribe. Uh, can we, could they be converted in serious problems? How could we um, predict if they will be serious threats? Yes, I've, I've commented a little bit about this, that uh, uh, we have many, many unpredicted invasions in the Caribbean from a species that were, have been reported uh, 80 years ago in Asia. And um, Christina, she, she's working now with an important, uh, with an ereophyte mite that is causing, uh, is really in highly populations infesting banana in, in Dominicana. And this might have never been reported in the world causing severe damages in banana. Then I think that is a great challenge to predict invasions. Sometimes it's possible to predict when we have the history invasion of one species in one area and uh, it means it is our, uh, it is already an invasive species in other areas uh, but sometimes it has been really unpredictable May I right. add, just just to add something the way, the best way perhaps to predict it, uh, is to look at the the pathways of commodities how commodities are moving around the world that is the best way <laughs> predict which is, will be the next invasive <laughs> okay guys i think you have this um, engaged the audience too much now so we have to leave unfortunately but please join us and be aware of my uh, communications and expand the word to your colleagues for these uh, fantastic webinars that are coming I thank you again, Maria and Denise, and a big, big clap uh, for both of you, the subcommittee, and we'll see you next month, hopefully, with other fantastic speakers. Thank you, everybody, and join us. Thank you.